the delay was me. Yes. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, I looked up and haven't updated the lecture from last year, so I don't remember if I have any numbers in here, but if they are, rest assured, they're different from this past year. Um, so a little background on me. I'm a pharmacist. I graduated from University of Oklahoma in 1992. Worked in hospital pharmacy for a couple of years, and a position came open at the Poison Center. And it was like, okay, this is my dream job. I didn't even think about pharmacists working there. We have um, we've had a physician assistant work there previously. Um, a good friend of mine who is now in El Paso um, working at the Poison Center. Uh, we. Um, got some nurses working there, so kind of a mix of medical <coughs> professionals. Just out of curiosity, I'd like to start with this. How many of you called the Poison Center before, either professionally or you know, for family? All right. Anybody have any bad experiences? Good experiences? Any props? Okay. <laughs> um, so I've, I've been there for nearly 25 years now. And love what I do something brand new every day. And that's what you guys are going to be doing, particularly in emergency medicine, and particularly in toxicology. Because our bread and butter is a two-year-old. Every single time that phone rings, I'd be willing to bet it's a two-year-old that's got to do And, you know, if I bet every time, I'd be a wealthy man. Um, I'll start like at 6, 7 o'clock in the morning when the family's up. And then when the family gets home, and the two-year-olds are roaming the house, mom and dad are trying to relax, you know, get ready for a nice evening with family. Two-year-olds are on a rampage, and it goes absolutely crazy. Um, so I've got some objectives for you here. To find a poison, decontamination methods. Here's a hint up front, decontamination methods. Methods of getting the poison or the substance out of the body, or preventing it from entering the bloodstream pretty much going away. We don't do that a whole lot anymore. The old thing was, oh, we're going to give them some syrup of Ipecac to make them throw up. We're going to pump their stomach. Not so much anymore. And a big reason for that is, is science. Just looking at, at, the, um, at the outcomes, patient outcomes. Um, we're going to talk about acetaminophen or Tylenol and salicylate poisons. Those are two of the most dangerous ones that you're going to run into if, if you're caring for a patient. Um, both of them can occur with chronic use. Say you have a patient who has bad teeth and is taking over-the-counter medication to um, just to control that pain. They can end up in really bad shape just from trying to control their pain. Somebody that has arthritis, your el elderly population. Um, I'm going to talk about a few prescription medications, not a whole lot. And we're going to talk about what kids get into. Uh, number one is the household agent, stuff that's around the house, usually under the, you know, under the sink is kind of a classic place. So I'm going to start with this. Um, how many of you have the number in your phone? If you, at some point, you can write this down. If you want, if you text the word poison, P-O-I-S-O-N to 797979. You'll immediately get back a V card. You click on it. It gets put in your um, in your address book, and that's it. You'll never hear from us again. It's just a means of getting your um, the number into your phone. And we would encourage you to call us for your family, for your friends, in your professional lives, not just for that two-year-old that gets into something, um, but you've got, say, uh, a patient comes in and you've got uh, 75 years old. It's on 15 different medications. One, that's a bad idea to start with. We'll look at drug interactions for you. We'll talk about age-related dosing adjustments. Um, pretty much anything that you can throw at us. I'm, my charge to my staff is answer the question if you can. Don't give them another telephone number to call. We're, we try and be all things to all people, um, except for the person who called me when I was on a night shift and said, what are the roads like down the way to Wichita? <laughs> I had to be, you know, at this point, you know, sorry, I'm going to punt on that one. That was pre-internet or pre-wide avail availability of the, of the internet. Otherwise, I would have looked it up for them. So, 
as I said, we're now we're pharmacists and, and uh, one nurse that's on staff. We answer questions from both the public as well as medical professionals. So about of our exposure calls, where somebody has actually got into something, um, be it that small child, somebody has accidentally double dosed on their medication, um, generates quite a few calls, um, intentionally tried to hurt themselves, or a friend has tried to do that. That's about 75% of our exposure calls. The other 25% are from usually intensivists and emergency room physicians and physician assistants and nurse practitioners who are, who are out there you know, covering an emergency department in a lot of times rural Oklahoma. So we get the question fairly frequently, especially from the public, not so much from medical professionals, but they'll say, what, we need to answer calls from physicians and these knowledgeable people who are caring for us, you know, if we get in a car wreck or something, and my answer is that's, that's precisely the point. These people that are out there in the emergency department have to deal with an MI, a motor vehicle accident, a stabbing, a gunshot wound, a stroke, and then they get some overdose on some obscure industrial chemical that they got at, you know, from the plant down the street. It's the only time they're going to see it in their lives. We might see it six times a year. So that's, that's kind of where we fit in. And our goal is to keep people out of the emergency department or out of the medical system if it's at all possible. And we're really successful at that. Of the calls that we're able to manage at home, meaning that they um, either are on the way to the emergency department, they just haven't made it to the emergency department yet. We're able to keep 91% of those calls at home. We're taking strain off of you in the emergency department, um, physician's offices, nurse practitioner practices, um, that's, that means they can work on people that actually need medical care. Um, that's money that doesn't get spent on Medicaid, Medicare, insurance companies. Uh, the ambulances can go on a run that they need to go on. We'll, we'll follow all these people through, sometimes for several days, depending on what type of exposure they have, so that we can ensure that everything's okay. If it starts to head south, then we'll get them into medical care and start coordinating with their therapy. So what's a poison? Pretty much anything <laughs> is a poison. There's a um, very famous guy, Paracelsus, who's kind of like the, the first person who systematically um, studied poisons and toxicology. And paraphrased, what he said is, everything is a poison, there's nothing that's not a poison. The only thing that makes a difference is the dose. So oxygen, you get too much oxygen, you kill your lungs. It's you know yeah. through oxidation. Um, water, you can get water toxicity, get hyponatremia, and develop seizures and dies. Cerebral edema. The story where um, I'm trying to remember how it went. There's radio station was giving away a vehicle, and um, you had to keep your hand on that vehicle if you had to. Um, no, no, it was drinking water. He had to drink a, some, a certain amount of water, and the last person to pee was the one who won the vehicle. And there was a woman who died from water toxicity in that situation. You just don't think of that as being potentially toxic. So that's pretty much anything that is poison. Um, decontamination. I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit. Serpa Vipitac, is anybody, I'd like to get a feel for this because we're a fairly young class here, it looks like. Does anybody know what, know what that is or has heard about it? I used to show in, um, an old Simpsons clip, not Simpsons, a family guy clip, where the guy, you know, they all buy it on Peter and Stewie drink, drink Serpa Vipitac, and then there's just, they vomit over and over. And it's typical family guy fashion. Um, they really do the ground, and the longer it goes, the harder people laugh. Except for one, one time I had a student just kind of run out. But even cartoon vomiting is enough to make him um, a little bit unsettled. But Tirkovit cac is an is extract of a plant that 
actually does two things. It stimulates the CTZ, the chemotactic tr uh, trigger zone in the brain. Um, it's responsible for, for vomiting. It also irritates the stomach lining. So it goes down and that pretty reliably about 10 or 15 minutes later it comes back up. The problem is it just never was shown to impact patient outcome at all. It didn't decrease the length of stay. It didn't decrease the number of admissions to healthcare facilities. It didn't decrease the number of emergency department visits. And there were some significant downsides to administration of serifibibicat. Um, for, one, for one, it's not good for every, every product or every type of substance that a person swallows. You swallow something that's corrosive, and you start vomiting, it's going to burn on the way back up, right? Mm -hmm. Swallow a hydrocarbon, something like lamp oil or lidofluid, and going down there's a risk of aspiration, getting that into the lungs. Well, coming back up, it's got another crack going down into the lungs. So we don't want to do that. Um, and, and again, it doesn't work, so why do it? Gastric lavage, it's pumping the stomach. There are still just a very few really old physicians out there that will do this. They call it therapeutic gastric lobotomy. So I'm, they're going to teach somebody a lesson <coughs> on the stomach. They're putting it down and still quite a bit of saline into the stomach and then basically use a uh, push-pull pump to pull it back out, um, the stomach contents. There's a problem with that. One, if a, a, there's several problems. If a corrosive, is swallowed and you go down, you may just go right through the back of the esophagus. There's some trauma potentially there. The oral gastric lavage tubes that are used are actually, the holes down at the end are pretty small. So it's sealed at one end and then just has little slits in it to kind of bring back up the stomach contents. Well, think about the vitamin that you take in the morning. Um, or especially an extended release formulation tablet or something that's not very soluble in water, it's not coming up back up anyway. It just won't fit into that tube. There's a risk for aspiration of putting stuff down in there and a person can aspirate their stomach contents. And so you're looking at a risk for infection. Bottom line is, just like the syrup of Ipecac, it does, there, there was never any evidence that it, that it worked. Now, trying it out, I mean, I can see it, it's tempting to think we decontaminate. Not, not as much of the drug or the chemical or the substance is getting into the body, so we're going to decrease the toxic effects. It just hasn't been borne out. Activated charcoal. That was when we stopped giving the Ipecac, which was available over the counter. It was advised to keep on um, everybody's, um, you know, in everybody's medicine cabinet. Um, Activated charcoal, we started pushing that. We are going to prevent it with this newer, high-tech stuff. Um, and theoretically, it would work great. It's got a tremendous, tremendous um, surface area, almost like a, a chemical sponge. So the idea is that as the drug dissolves, it gets adsorbed onto and into all these tiny microscopic pockets on the activated charcoal and then it just passes through the GI tract and it comes out the other end. You know what? Again, studies, science got in the way of administering it. Um, it, it there's very little, very few situations in which administering it back um, actually impacts outcome, changes <laughs> outcome of the patient. Anything that goes through enterohepatic inter recirculation, yeah, potentially with the multiple dose activated charcoal, we can catch some of that stuff as it, as it is recirculated. Um, but again, aspiration is. Um, until you've seen an activated charcoal aspiration, I mean, looking at x ray of one of those, it's ugly, ugly, ugly. So that was occurring, and it doesn't taste good. It's difficult to get patients to take it voluntarily. So then the goal is, oh, we're going to put down an NG tube and start instilling it in there, and then you start to see maybe potentially some of the same problems that you would see on a larger scale, because of larger tube, with, with um, gastric lavage. Multiple dose activated charcoal um, we use occasionally um, for extended release formulations of tablets or capsules. And those drugs 
that undergo interlymphatic recirculation. Um, very few of them, there's a position statement that was put out by the American College of Clinical Toxicology, it, just five, five um, drugs, and none of them are in drug use. You're not going to see them, they're, they're basically the store of drugs now at this point, so um, it's kind of on the way out. When we get the, that repeated activated charcoal, however, just for completeness of information, we get it, it's, it's kind of a best guess to the, to the clinician. Every two to four hours, total of three doses. Beyond that, you're just packing charcoal down into them, and you know, they're going to be making charcoal for pets in the, in the gut. So it actually may end up causing that structure. So that's kind of on, on the way out. One that's on the rise, however, is whole bowel irrigation. And when I first heard that phrase, I thought, oh, whole bowel, it's like a garden hose or something. You <laughs> put it up the rectum and just kind of turn on the flow. No, it's actually, you go at it from the other way. You're giving polyethylene by glycol solution. So um, think go lightly or colite that you'd use for a bowel prep. Only you give a lot more for a bowel prep. The patient is drinking, you start off with two liters, and the goal is to do two liters an hour. It doesn't taste good, it's got kind of a salty taste. Um, and then they flavor it and say, oh, you know, refreshing lemon lime flavor. No. <laughs> I'm going with Cold Guard. I'm, I'm over 50. Cold Guard for me. <laughs> so um, I, I don't like those bowel preps. Um, the, the idea is, is very attractive though. Something that doesn't dissolve well, something that fo can form a concretion or a or in the stomach, like aspirin tablets, anything that's enteric coated, iron tablets, they can form just kind of big lump in there. And what we do with giving this, this um, PEG solution, this polyethylene glycol solution, is just start pushing it through the GI tract. Keep giving it, if the patient will voluntarily, voluntarily drink it, make sure a, a toilet or a bed pan is nearby because it's going to start coming out the other end really quick and they continue drinking it until they basically are passing clear fluids. One, another situation where we occasionally use this is what are called body stuffers. It's the person who has a packet of drugs might be methamphetamine, heroin, cocaine, whatever. They're driving along, they see the lights flashing in, in the back. They've got to get rid of the evidence, right? What if the cop searches my car? So what do they do? They swallow it. So it's like a ticking time bomb. You've got somebody who potentially um, is going to start seizing in jail or stop breathing in jail if it's an opioid. Usually the staff under have a pretty good idea. They'll take them to the emergency department and our goal is to one, we'll put down some activated charcoal. If they're if they're not if they haven't lost their gag reflex and they're not real um, drowsy and lethargic. And we'll start following it immediately with, with this peg solution. The reason we put down the charcoal is because if that packet does burst, it's going to be immediately, depending on the dose, life threatening. So we want something around to help prevent it getting, from getting down the um, or into the bloodstream. And then we just hope that that, that um, peg solution is going to do its job and push it through before the packet ruptures. But the people who are carrying around stuff like that, they're carrying in like little, little Ziploc bags or cigarette wrappers, that kind of stuff. They're not real good about packaging things stuff up real well so that they don't push. So what kind of what kind of experience does this class have, or as a group, clinical experience? Feel free to shout it out. I mean, are you just now starting out and decide, decide I want to be a PA? How much patient care? I was a I was a dental hygienist for four years. Okay. Medical assistant. Medical assistant. Okay. So you may have seen or heard about. Oh, I had a good friend, or I have a good friend, whose daughter was over at the class in the School of Science and Arts, and she wanted to 
come and spend a month at the Poison Center. They have to do what a, a research project and learn in depth about something. I said, sure, send her on over. And the first day there, she was listening in on calls, and, and about 2 o'clock in the afternoon, she goes, what's the deal with Tylenol? Mm -hmm. Because we've had like six calls on Tylenol overdoses that day, and that is not unusual. <laughs> It's in everybody's house, it's over the counter, widely available, and very frequently people think of Tylenol as being not toxic because it's so easily available. I mean, why would you, why would you be able to buy a 500 or a 1,000 count bottle of something if it, if it was toxic? That's the thinking of most of the public. One of the very um, scary things about acetaminophen is it's in a lot of different things. So people who have the flu, flu season is coming out. Um, we've got, actually, it's been here for almost a month. Did you know that? That's scary. Um, but you got people who will be achy. They'll want to take care of their nasal passages and um, kind of clear things open with decongestants. But they're going to be taking probably a multi-symptom multi product that has acetaminophen in it. They'll be taking acetaminophen by itself. And sometimes they'll be prescribed a cough medication that has acetaminophen in, in it as well. So they're getting double or triple doses of it. Over a period of a few days, that's enough to potentially cause some liver damage. Um, prescription medications. We're not seeing as much prescribing with, of the Lortab, of the opioid acetaminophen combinations, but I guess in Oklahoma that's relative. I mean, there are millions and millions of doses dispensed still. Have you guys talked much about the changes in the laws with prescribing them? Probably not a whole lot. Yeah, they're getting ready to pop up from Dr. Lovelace. He's okay. He's going to go yeah. over the opioid crisis. And oh, yeah. yeah. It's um, still, you know, hundreds of thousands of people being prescribed those and using those every day. You put that in combination with People don't make the connection. So they say, I'm taking Tylenol, and I'm taking APAP, and I'm taking acetaminophen. In their eyes, those are all three different things. They don't realize that that abbreviation on the prescription bottle label, APAP, means acetaminophen. They don't, re they don't make that connection between the generic and acetaminophen and Tylenol. So through no fault of their own, they're, they're putting their livers at risk. Isn't that why Lord talks on the thing anymore? Because that's so much to see the medicine in it? They changed it. The, the dosing on those went down dramatically. So the Wartabs had 500 milligrams of acetaminophen in them. Um, the combination products out there now, I think, have a max of 325 in them. So they had to change the name because it's a little bit different from Norco. Right. But that's the only difference between Lortab and Norco. So that's where your education comes in. Make sure that you're educating your patients anytime you're prescribing those medications to not add any other product or the counter that may have time on it. Um, as well as educating them to anything that you prescribe them that might be an addictive product. Um, that is your job as a provider to be presenting that to them so that they can keep themselves safe. Yeah, it's, it's a huge problem. And we've had you know, multiple kind of tragic um, situations in the state where people have just taken over the counter products. Um, there's, there's one 17 year old girl in Norman that still kind of haunts me a little bit. And we didn't have an opportunity to really weigh in on it because by the time she got to the emergency department um, to try and figure out what's going on, you know, she, it was too late even really for a liver transplant. There, there wasn't even time to get her on the, on the list before she died. So duplication of therapy is a, is a big deal. Um, we talked about taking over-the-counter products due to the, the two big ones are, I don't agree, arthritis pain, typically in the knees, back pain, lower back pain, and um, dental pain. So people will try to manage those at home with the over-the-counter options that they have available. Now, they may be taking, in, in addition to that acetaminophen, they may be you know, pretty smart, pretty savvy, and realize you can overdose on acetaminophen, but they're chowing down on ibuprofen as well, naproxen as well. That opens up a whole new world of problems because of the antiplatelet effects 
um, some of those, and the, the erosion of gastric mucosa, um, old people that, that take them regularly show up with, with severe ulcerations of the gastrointestinal tract, of the, of the anti-inflammatories. So um, it's a different kind of a problem, but it's not quite as deadly a problem, potentially, as it's in the We talked about this. Talked about that. Talked about that. Um, one, of, one of the scary things about acetaminophen overdose is that even if I were to take 150 of them right now, I might have a little bit of stomach upset this afternoon, but that really is about it. There's not any overt signs of symptoms of, of poisoning until two or three days later. And at that time, the liver enzymes are in the tens of thousands, and the liver is shocked, essentially. It's, it's time to get a person on the, um, on the transplant list. So we want to get that person in as soon as we can uh, and, and get them treated. <coughs> every single patient, every single patient that comes into the emergency department with an intentional overdose of anything, even if they took two baby aspirin, if their intent was to harm themselves, you got to take them seriously. Because if you discharge them home and they find a gun and kill themselves, they're in that state of mind. There was intent there. But every patient that comes in, we want to get an acetaminophen on them. Why is that? Because of the lack of symptoms, right? They, there's something strange that happens. There's some regret that goes on with, um, with patients who take medications with the intent to harm, harm themselves. They start figuring out pretty quick that if I let them know that I was trying to harm myself, I'm, I'm kind of signing up for 72 hours in a psych facility for evaluation. So they'll start trying to minimize. When they get to the emergency department, almost always the story is completely different than what they told us. You know, we've got, we got to assume the worst, right? And so it's the incredible, ever-changing story. They will start minimizing the amounts of things that they've taken and start dropping off things that they took as well. So they might tell us they took seven different things. Oh no, it was two things and it was a therapeutic error. And the only way to, in a timely fashion, administer the antidote for, for acetaminophen is to, is to get that level. And it's something that should be available in every hospital in the state, in the country. Um, because every two or three, two or three times a year, we catch a case where a person swears they didn't take it, and their and their Tylenol level was through, their acetaminophen level was through. If we had not done it, they would they would die. So that's that's the goal there. So, what happens when a person overdoses on Tylenol? Tylenol gets absorbed into the bloodstream. Starts doing its thing. First place it goes to is the liver, right? Um, the liver is going to detoxify. The body sees that acetaminophen as a foreign substance. Got to get rid of it. We're going to start conjugating things onto it, breaking it up, making it more water soluble, so it can be urinated out, go out in the feces. That's fine, but one of the breakdown products of of acetaminophen of Tylenol is toxic to the liver. The liver immediately, it, it kind of gets past that by immediately conjugating that chemical that's generated, and it's, I think it may be here, um, NAPQI, NAPQI is what we call it. The liver recognizes NAPQI, bam, hooks it up to a glutathione, and it's all of a sudden not toxic and be, can be excreted in the urine. Well, what, what happens if you've got a patient that overwhelms the amount, by taking 150 tablets, overwhelms the amount of glutathione available in their body? Maybe you've got somebody that's alcoholic who gets all of their calories from alcohol. You've got a person who's just malnourished because they're poor and can't eat a good diet. All of those are going to predispose a person to acetaminophen toxicity. And when 
the, the liver runs out of glutathione to immediately detoxify that NAPK. NAPK is very, very reactive. It goes looking for the next available thing to conjugate with, to bind onto. What's the next available thing? It's a liver cell. So in the process of binding, it destroys the liver cell. So right there in the center of the liver, it's called central ovular necrosis, center of the liver starts essentially decaying, if you will. It's, it's destroyed by that excess metabolite. Liver fails and it's liver dialysis, um, hopefully to maintain them until they can do a transplant. It's a good example here of, look at all the, um, on the right, a good liver. You can see essentially, see almost all these holes in the liver? That's, that's where the napki has done the damage. So it's kind of, if you will, eat away at the liver is a good way to think about it. So I mentioned getting an acetaminophen level for these patients. This is something that's probably going to be in every emergency department that you go through. It's called the Rumac Matthew Nomogram, and that's for the two authors that published this journal, in, or that published this article in Pediatrics in 1975. Um, Barry Rumac, and I don't know who Matthews is because Rumac is like a rock star, one of the one of the aging rock stars of toxicology. But this is a very good way to predict whether or not your patient is going to develop. Um, acetaminophen toxicity. So what we do is just get an acetaminophen level. The only, co well there are, there are a few caveats. The primary caveat is that if it's taken all at once, <coughs> acutely, we want to make sure that it's at least four hours after when it was taken. Because that allows us to make the assumption that all of that, all of that has been absorbed, it's in the bloodstream, so I'm getting a, a peak level. So what we do Fairly straightforward. We plot the patient's level at remember a maximum or a minimum of four hours after the ingestion, and plot that's on the y-axis is their level. On the x-axis is the amount of time since the ingestion. So at four hours, if they if they're up around 150, that's going to put them right over that solid line. Anything in that gray area, in other words, anything over that solid line. We're going to treat them with antidote. Pretty straightforward. So why are there two lines on there? That dotted line, the Rumac Matthew line, is uh, in the paper, in the study that they performed that generated this nomogram, anything over that line, the patient was likely to develop hepatic toxicity. Well, we don't want it to be either likely or not likely. So if they lowered it down 25%, to give them a margin of safety. So it's that, that solid line is 25% below where we expect to see likely to see the toxicity. If the story you get is straight, and that's that's something that I hope if they haven't taught you, you will learn in short order, is that patients lie. They lie to you for no reason. Um, but if you've got a good feeling that, yeah, the story I got is correct, or maybe it was witnessed, or witnessed ingestion, then you can rely on this and the patient will not get ill if they, if they get nothing in the hand or appropriately. Where is it not good? Well, if you've got an extended release formulation, there's a, a product called Tylenol Extended Relief for people with arthritis, 650 milligrams of acetaminophen in that one. But it's a weird, it's a weird product. 325 milligrams of that dissolves immediately, so they get the equivalent of a regular strength column hit their system. And then the remaining 325 milligrams is extended release. So we know that they, they haven't reached their peak, right? Because it's going to continue for the next six hours or so to be absorbed into their bloodstream. So all bets are off. Can't really use this or if a person has been taking excess acetaminophen over several days. Not enough to cause an acute toxicity, but maybe right now the, the current maximum recommended amount for acetaminophen in daily, is, in an adult, 
is three grams, maybe they've been taking five grams a day, 10, ten of the extra strength tablets, and they do that for three, four, or five days, <coughs> that's potentially enough to deplete all those glutathione storm, um, stores and, and cause toxicity. That's where people tend to get in trouble, is with chronic OVOs. The levels don't mean anything in that. So if they don't mean anything, then what do we do? How do we, how do we approach it? We look at the patient, we do some labs. I can't stress enough. Look at what's going on with your patient. They got right up with quadrant pain, they've been vomiting, they've had some diarrhea. That's maybe an indication they've got something going on with their liver. Um, get some lab tests. Remember that the um, the liver enzymes that you get, the AST and the ALT, are an indication of acute injury. It means that the, that the injury happened just recently. If it happened three or four days ago, their, livers, their liver enzymes might be back down to normal. So we've got to look for other clues as to whether or not they're suffering adverse effects to taking too much time off. What would we look for? I mean, any thoughts? A lot of the clotting factors come out of the liver. So we could get an eye on R on them. And I guarantee you if they've got liver damage and it's more than 24 hours, you're going to start to see that INR rising. So that might be another indication that even though the damage is done, the antidotes may be of some benefit. There's, there's a lot of conjecture about why that happens. We talked about this, renal function patients, there, there's also some potential for that nap key to get to um, renal tubules and cause some um, acute tubular necrosis. But the antidote is, is N-acetylcysteine. It's also called mucamus. It's also called acetidote. Acetidote is the IV formulation. So when a person gets this excess, this exogenous, um, glutathione in their body, either by drinking it, it's nasty, it's nasty, it smells like rotten eggs, it tastes like rotten eggs. How do I know that? I've tried it. I mean, if I'm going to recommend something, right, I'm going to want to know if the patient is going to take it. Um, I got, when I was working in the hospital, I got a, um, got a visit from a pediatrician that was just really mad with me, and we were usually on, on a pretty good basis. Um, and he said, Scott, why are none of my pediatric patients taking that compounded flagell that, that I, I send orders down for? And I said, come on back. <laughs> and again, tasted it. There is nothing you can do to mask a flavor of nitrogenazole. It tastes like the most metallic, bitter taste you can imagine. And I mean, even now, 25 years later, I can taste that taste. It's stuck with um, the same thing goes for with the with the mucus. It's it's compliance isn't the greatest um, unless you've got somebody standing over them having them drink it. That's why the IV formulation has become um, pretty much the go-to formulation, and for another reason we talked about. So when you take when you get that exogenous N-acetylcysteine in the body, the body converts a significant portion of that to glutathione. <coughs> Bam! You got you got uh, reinforcements going to the liver. To, to conjugate with that nap key. Also, in a pinch, the liver can use the N-acetylcysteine itself to bind up that nap key. So, it's a great antidote if, if you can get the patient to take it. Mention the oral, oral formulation. Downside to using that, besides the taste, is that you have to give it every four hours for 72 hours. That's a total of 18 doses. I want to be pretty sure that the patient gets all of that um, because, you know, if they, if they stop too early, they, they can end up, you know, still with liver damage. So that means the patient's going to be in the hospital for <coughs> two hours. They're going to have three nights, possibly in the intensive care unit, if the hospital is being really, um, really cautious about care for the patient. But at least they're going to get um, thousands and thousands of dollars. Now the IV formulation is a lot, a lot more expensive. It's sterile, it's pyrogen free, it's um, 
they've got a lock on the market and for the ID formulation. And but the good thing about it is it can be run in infused in 21 hours. <coughs> so and you might have a patient in for 23 hour hops and you know get them out before they even incur a day charge. So it saves the insurance companies a lot of money. If the patient um, doesn't have insurance, it's going to save the hospital a lot of money in write-offs. Um, it's tolerated remarkably well. There's, if you infuse it too fast, um, occasionally there is a patient has an anaphylactoid reaction. But they start to develop um, you know, some redness of the skin, itching. It's, it looks like the onset of an anaphylactic reaction, but they don't have that really severe uh, swelling of the upper airway. It can be life threatening. Just slow down the rate, rate of administration. That goes away. The patient gets their antidote and can send them on their way. I'm trying to think of any other things with acetylcysteine or Tylenol. Um, no real good stories. The good stories, the, the frightening stories, come with aspirin. And, with, and for the past probably five or six years, we've seen a dramatic re resurgence in the number of aspirin overdoses that have been reported to us. We've seen a dramatic increase in the number of mishandled aspirin overdoses that have been reported because it's really, really tricky. Um, that's, I think this is the kind of thing where you can help us. We, we had a patient dying just the other day. Same thing that we're going to talk about that leads a lot of people down the wrong path and, and ends up killing the patient rather than helping them. Um, I'm going to have to send our, our clinical toxicologist out and, and myself, and we're going to have to blanket the state talking to the physicians that are in emergency departments because, because poor care can actually hasten a patient's death with the, with the solicitor. One thing to be aware of is that the, the public doesn't know what they're taking. They said, I took a handful of aspirin. It could be Tylenol, it could be naproxen, it could be vitamin C. I mean, a pill is a Tylenol. And, and that sounds ridiculous, but that's the way people think. Anything over the counter for pain is Tylenol, or it's an aspirin. So they tell you took, they took aspirin, get a Tylenol right now, also, and vice versa. So there's a, there's a mnemonic that, that we use for, you know, that when I'm training new staff members coming on to the poison center, we kind of get an idea of what uh, in an overdose an aspirin um, exposure looks like. Aspirin, altered mental status. And we start off with the one, one of the major ones that right off the bat, if you've got a patient that's coming in with altered mental status, it means that the aspirin is already starting to penetrate the brain. When the, when the aspirin's penetrating the brain, it's almost, they're circling the brain. It's almost time for death. So you have to get on top of things immediately. Patient with altered mental status. Sweating, diaphoresis, their temperature goes up. Well, we take aspirin for, for a fever, right? Helps bring that fever down. Well, in excess doses, it actually stops the cellular, cellular production of energy. That energy has to go somewhere, and so the body releases it as heat. So that's why patients come in um, often with um, severely heat block. Uh, pulmonary edema is fairly characteristic. Increased vital signs. So the blood pressure is going to go up, the heart rate is going to go up. And the one we really want to pay attention to is the respiratory rate. And we'll explain the reasons, I'll explain the reasons why the respiratory rate goes up. Bringing in the air, so tinnitus, um, early sign of, of uh, aspirin toxicity. Patients irritable, that kind of goes with the altered mental status. And nausea and vomiting, probably the first toxic symptom of the aspirin dose. So, we've got Nausea, vomiting, the swinginess, the ringing in the ears. Maybe they're, they're, you're having to speak up to that patient. You know, shout to them because um, 
it, it just, I'm not sure the mechanism has ever been identified for why it causes the remaining years in the deafness. It's, it goes back to, likely, one of the phrases before I took my boards, I memorized a phrase. The mechanism of action of this um, effect has not been fully elucidated. Right? Makes me sound like I really know what I'm saying, what I'm talking about, know what it means is I have no idea. You know, and if I'm right that we really don't know, then you know I can walk looking pretty good. If not, you know, they're gonna call me on it. But I, I pulled that out of my holster a couple of times when I was writing my, my uh, answers. So that's my gift to you. Don't use it in her class. Okay? It's very other instructors. Hyperventilation. So what happens with, with an aspirin like this? We actually get um, a triggering centrally of an increase in the, in the respiratory rate. So a person starts kind of huffing and puffing, right? So when you breathe rapidly, what happens with the CO2 in the, in the pH, the patient's pH? pH is going to go up. They're going to get a respiratory alkalosis. All right? That's what's actually triggering, triggering that increased respiratory rate. Later is when things really start to crash. Um, but you get initially that, that triggering of the respiratory rate, the body is going to start reacting by conserve, conserving high hydrogen ion and with the decrease in the, not decrease, the stopping of energy production in the electron transport chain, you're going to have actually all kinds of excess hydrogen ion being generated in the body. So in addition to a compensatory metabolic acidosis developing, because the kidneys are trying to you know, balance things out and keep that pH normal, you've got the toxic um, anion gap to metabolic acidosis on top of that. So you got a metabolic acidosis, they're compensating, trying to compensate with their kidneys. Um, and all of a sudden you got kind of this severe metabolic um, acidosis roaring up. At some point, they're going to balance each other out. The acidosis and the alkalosis is just enough so when you get that, those lab results and it says the patient's pH is 7.4 and you go, bingo, that's, a, that's what I want. Until you look beyond it you find out that their bicarb is six. You find out, I mean, that's a patient who's ready to die. And it happens every single time in this fear of risk. There's a point where the patient may not be terribly symptomatic as far as the CNS, but one look at arterial blood gases is enough to raise the hair on the back of the neck. Um, the acidemia, when a patient, it, the acidemia very rapidly overwhelms that um, central stimulation of the respiratory rate, and the patient be becomes in a, in a severely acidotic state, and in an acid state, it greatly enhances the penetration of this aspirin into the brain. So remember, I said, when, when people die when it gets into the brain, that's when they crash very rapidly. They also get severely hypokalemic. So it's almost impossible to correct their acidosis with, um, with bicarb until you um, get them normal kaolin. You know, they're going to need some, some uh, potassium supplementation. But the story goes even further than that. So peak is about four to six hours unless you've got one of those big chunks of these oil in your gut. Um, where it's formulated. There's an old nomogram, there was, there was an attempt, actually it predated the um, rheumatic Matthew nomogram, um, to do a, a nomogram for salicylate toxicity. It doesn't work. It's still in some textbooks. It's called the Dung nomogram. So if you don't use that, we just look at the patient. If they are huffing and puffing, um, that's, that's your biggest sign right there. That's, that's my charge to the staff members. Every time anybody asks you about and see a medical or else, first question out of your mouth should be, what's the respiratory rate? Because that tells us whether or not the patient is, is really ill or is getting ready to be bad. 
Um, full valve irrigation, if it's, if it's an enteric coated formulation, yeah, we might think about doing that. Push it on through. Um, a lot of times with enteric coated formulations, you can actually see them on the x-ray of kidney, ureter, and bladder. So get an x-ray of kind of this area here, and you might see 50 or 100 tablets in there. Then you know things are bad. You got to push that on through with, with the go lightly. If you don't see anything, does that mean they're okay? X-rays are notoriously hard to read for you know stuff in the gut. So yeah, it's it's kind of helps one way, but it also unless you're aware of potential problem, um, it not showing up, it can actually kind of lead you astray. So keep that in mind. <coughs> We're going to have to keep the volume going. Their um, fluid volume. They're losing through breathing fast, they're losing a lot of fluid, insensible loss of, of water, and they're sweating, so we're losing a lot of fluid that way. So we yeah, need to do a volume resuscitation, replenish the, um, the potassium in the body so that we can give them bicarb. Now the goal is not to try and offset that severe acidosis because we couldn't put enough bicarb in them to overwhelm it. One, they blow up like a balloon. Number two, their sodium level is going to go through the roof because we're, in addition to that bicarb, we're infusing sodium along with it. Our goal is just to get their pH of their urine to a slightly alkaline state. And at that point, you very rapidly start to excrete sodium salicylates, the aspirin. It, it's, it's much more rapidly excreted in an alkaline environment than we are. So that doesn't always work. I mean, think about the patient that's coming in that's really sick, and we don't have time to correct their potassium. They're really starting to become symptomatic. Dialysis works great for an aspirin overdose. So if, if you get a sick patient, anytime their level gets up over, over 100, um, and actually, I, I probably, on the side of caution, I usually start recommending dialysis at about 80. Um, and part of that is due to unpublished data that came from, when I was, when I was preparing for boards, I spent a month in, in Detroit, or not a month, the summer in Detroit. You want to see poisonous go to Detroit. It was incredible what came in every single day. And they had me on both teams in the, in the emergency department, so I basically didn't sleep for a summer. But I learned that somehow. But they did a study that when they got up over 100, half their patients died. So I, I tend to be a little bit more cautious just being aware of that. Um, if a patient's bad enough, dialysis really is the only way to go. So what will harm your patient won't harm your patient. That's another section of this lecture. But it goes to what I was going to talk about, about how patients get killed with an aspirin and there are multiple times this has happened in the state, and that's what's prompting me to want to go out and have our people um, frame, frame these emergency department physicians, the nurse practitioners, um, the PAs. You breathe in really fast, right? You start to develop some central nervous system just off a little bit. And in that small hospital, they realize, hey, this is getting bad. We can't handle this. We're going to have to put them on a helicopter and then get them to a tertiary care facility because they're going to need to be dialyzed. So you got a patient that's exhibiting some oddity of the way they're breathing. They have central nervous system depression. They put that patient on a ventilator, right? They're going to protect their airway and keep them breathing during that transport. And they set the ventilator rate at 20. Remember, they're breathing really, really fast. They might be breathing 40 or 50 times a minute. And they're, they're doing that for a reason. The body is trying to blow off all that acid. If you artificially slow down the heart rate, you're going to drive their pH through the floor. They're going to get severely, incredibly acidotic in very, very short order. Acid environment goes into the brain, and the patient dies. So, I, I, it's not that I would never advise putting a patient with an aspirin overdose on the ventilator. I'm sure there are cases where that 
I'm not going to recommend any settings. Our medical toxicologists probably, I mean, that's a pulmonologist territory in combination with medical toxicologists. So, if you can keep them off the that way, that's the way to go. Let the body do what it has best and I'm trying to um, compensate for that severe acidosis. All right, let's take a break. How long, how long, 10 minutes?